Conan O'Brien were planning a major military operation. His soldiers would be caught out in the open, surrounded by hostile forces. With great difficulty, he got a radio message to the patrol. Eventually we got to Colwesi. We thought we would overnight there, but we were told to get back to Elizabethville as quickly as possible. There was problems arising in the city. The commander of the patrol, who was Captain Bourne, Dermot Bourne at that time, we said, OK, we'll keep going. So we got back to Elizabethville about 5 o'clock that evening to find that there was a military operation to take place the following morning of arresting the various Belgian officers that in Elizabethville and the area. In July 1961, in an attempt to restore state authority, the UN reconvened the Congolese parliament. Delegates, some brought at gunpoint, were locked up and forbidden alcohol and other distractions. They were not allowed to leave until they came up with a new government acceptable to the UN. They were trying to get a political solution to all their troubles and all the politicians, if you would call them politicians, were gathered together in the Louvenium. I was in charge of the cigarettes and the sweets and other things of that nature that the Congolese would like uh, were under my control. And they were given chits, which they had to hand in to me and sign for their ration of goodies. And in that way, I met them all. They had to come up and sign the book. After much effort, the UN did manage to get the Congolese parliament reconvened, and Mobutu handed over to Mr. Odula as prime minister of a new central government of national reunion. One of Mr. Odula's first acts was to pass an ordinance for the expulsion of all foreign officers and mercenaries from Katanga, and he asked the UN to help him in this. Four days later, on August the 28th, the UN representative in Katanga, Dr. Conor O'Brien, set about this task of removing 512 white officers from the Katanga forces. The uh, task of our company, A Company, was to take over the gendarme headquarters, which was in the centre of the city. And uh, at this stage, I had never even seen the actual target. And my mission, particularly number three platoon, was to take over and set up roadblocks outside the gendarme headquarters. And at five o'clock on that morning, on the 28th of August, this big palace came into, into view. And there was a couple of sentries at the gate, gendarme sentries, which just their floor there. And there was an armor care board that went in the gate real fast. And I was in a, the Willis Jeep. Flew in the gate too, jumped off the Willie's Jeep and entered the palace. Get in if you could. Luckily enough, as we rounded the corner outside the gendarme headquarters, the sentries had disappeared. And very quickly we set up our roadblocks. And just as we were setting the roadblocks up, we heard the first bursts of fire. At that stage, Combat and Quinlan uh, led the charge in an APC through the gates of the gendarme headquarters and in the space of 15 minutes had captured the headquarters itself plus the guard of approximately 30 Katangans. My own platoon uh, arrested four Belgian mercenary officers, and one of them actually handed me his pistol when we arrested him uh, as he was driving into the headquarters. They were annoyed. Uh, one particular guy, uh, my platoon commander, uh, the late Colonel Joe Leach, uh, was trying to question him and get his name, and he wouldn't. He didn't want to give any information. So he had a, a Beretta pistol. So Joe took the pistol off, and he was very annoyed about that. So eventually he gave his name on that. But no one was killed in that engagement, and they gave in quite readily. And we captured all the uh, Belgian officers as they reported in for work that morning, and later saw them being uh, deported, but we didn't really see them as the enemy. And I got an order to get one section of my platoon, that'd be 10 men, get onto a DC Dakota um, aircraft 
fill it with mercenaries and fly to Camina and handed them over to the, the 1st Infantry Group, an Irish unit, in Camina. All in all, it was a long day and it was a hectic day. Not one I'd easily forget. An elated O'Brien sent a message to the Irish troops. I wish to express my profound gratitude and pride on the results of the action. The results were so spectacular that they have resounded throughout the whole world. Chomba, taken by surprise, broadcast his submission and announced the dismissal of all foreigners from his army. Before the operation was completed, O'Brien ordered a halt to the arrests under pressure from the consuls of the colonial powers. Uh, that decision, uh, which now appears wrong, uh, was taken by me uh, on my own responsibility uh, in consultation with General Raja. It was taken following an engagement given to me by the Belgian Consul General, Monsieur Henri Crenel, that if we would stop the forcible arrest of the uh, foreign officers, he would see to it, Belgium would see to it, that they were repatriated immediately. Raja insisted that remaining officers were to present themselves voluntarily at UN assembly centers within two days, or arrests would resume. Most Belgian regulars complied, but a hard core of French and Belgian mercenaries went underground. Jadotville, second city in Katanga, and 90 miles from Elizabethville, was home to thousands of white settlers, with a large gendarmerie training camp close by. It was also the headquarters of Union Minière, the giant Belgian-British mining company that bankrolled Chombe. Raja ordered a UN force to set up an assembly center in Jadotville. The Swedish commander arrived first, but decided that the mission was not feasible and made the decision to return. I was the first Irish officer ever to go into Jadaville. When I got there with my platoon, which was about 36 soldiers, Mida was there to greet me, and obviously he had itchy feet, and he only had about eight to 10 soldiers with him. All others had left, and he told me that we were in a very dangerous place, that we shouldn't be here, that's in Jadaville. And uh, I asked him for a briefing, and he said, I've just given it to you, you shouldn't be here, it's dangerous. And with that, he mounted up in a vehicle and he left. And on the second night, quite a substantial mob, I would call them, of people, came out from the town of Jadaville. Now, they were all white people and uh, they were very threatening to us. And naturally, we were armed and we produced uh, quite a number of troops who put on the, the gas masks and got gas canisters ready, because these people were very angry that we should be there. In this group of prosperous Katanga businessmen, two are Belgians and two British. I wanted to find out what they thought about life in independent Katanga. Before the United Nations troops arrived, we were in, uh, in security. You were secure before? Yes. Have they made any difference? No. Frankly, I don't think anything of the United Nations was. Uh, well, we could really do without them. Consequent to that, it was decided by battalion headquarters and Katanga Command that B Company, our company, should about turn the following day and go back to Elizabethville. Stirred up by his Union Minière backers, Trombe and his interior minister, Godefroy Munongo, orchestrated a violent campaign against the UN. They also began a vicious harassment of the anti Chombe Baluba tribe. 35,000 people left their homes for UN compounds, creating a humanitarian disaster. The white population was terrified of the refugees and also feared that the gendarmes would mutiny without their white officers. The Belgian consul pleaded for a UN garrison in Jadotville insisting that the UN was now responsible for the protection of the white population. 
Under pressure from Belgium and Britain, Hammarskjöld ordered that the UN go back to Jadoville with this new mission. We were brought out to uh, Jadoville in trucks supplied by the UN. And all that was remained of these when they went back after dropping us in Jadoville was one broken down truck, two jeeps, one ambulance and the company commander's car. As we moved around the place in our jeeps, as we went out to show the flag and to reassure the population, we were hindered at every turn by gendarmerie who had set up roadblocks. They also drove uh, truckloads of troops through our position and they could do that because the road ran through our position. Our position had been selected by a civilian United Nations person, not for any military advantage, but merely as a place to lodge. When Commandant Quinlan decided to meet the uh, burgomaster in the town uh, and was told uh, to remove himself and his company and UN from Janetville immediately, and uh, it was fairly obvious that the white population did not want us there and that we were not welcome. So the first thing that was done as soon as we landed in Jadotville was to dig in. You know, because he, he must have, maybe he heard something or maybe there was rumours going about, I, I, I don't know. But Troops got more and more passing by, bigger trucks, more troops heading toward into uh, Jadotville from Elizabethville. So they were building up troops all the time. We could see the gendarmerie digging in around us. And I think at that stage, there were several efforts to have us withdrawn, which were ignored. My father became very much aware very, very quickly that the mission he was given in, to, in Jadaville was really not uh, a good mission. And I know that he sent uh, the doctor, uh, Commandant Joe Clune and uh, Captain Liam Donnelly back to Elizabethville to uh, ask for maybe a different mission. Uh, I know that this was discussed with uh, Cruz O'Brien and the result was anyway they were told to stay in Jadaville, the mission hadn't changed. We were about due to leave when a message, a radio message came, well, don't come back, we're surrounded. And I think the most important thing that we took that time was, was a small truck out of pack rations. In Elizabethville, tension between the UN and the Katangese reached boiling point. UN head of civilian operations in the Congo, the forceful Tunisian Mahmoud Kiari, came up with a plan of action. UN troops would take over Elizabethville and force Chomba to cooperate. Chiari gave O'Brien arrest warrants for Chomba and his cabinet. As I understand it, Monsieur, from your account, Monsieur Fabri, the legal advisor, gave you a number of warrants for arrest. Did those warrants for arrest include one for Mr. Chomba? They did, but this was only to be used uh, if Mr. Chomba were unwilling to cooperate. UN Secretary General Hammarskjöld was due in the Congo and was adamant that nothing be done without his authorization. But Chiari did not intend to wait. When Chombe rejected one last request to go to Leopoldville, Chiari gave the go-ahead for Operation Mortor. This time, he said, there were to be no half measures. The gendarmes were patrolling on the hour uh, by our camp and our company commander told us to just act normal as if nothing was wrong or nothing happening. So um, he had us digging the trenches at night and we, we were annoyed over this and gave him a, a few swears. <laughs> but uh, little did we know how valuable those trenches were going to be to us. At the radio station, the UN asked the Katangese guards by loudspeaker to leave, promising them they would not be disarmed. The guards refused. There was a bloody battle in which 24 Katangese and one Swedish officer were killed. Force is force, even when exerted by international police, and the fruit is bitter. Although the Katangese were forewarned and waiting, the key buildings of Elizabethville were soon under United Nations control. Gendarme casualties were heavy, and Katangese morale wavering. 
the Indian UN troops at the radio station had killed all their prisoners with hand grenades. However, only one minister was captured. The others had already fled. Chombe called O'Brien to ask for a ceasefire. In return for a guarantee of his personal safety, he would announce on radio the end of Katangi's secession. At 6.30, O'Brien called a press conference to inform the world that the secession of Katanga was over. But his statement was premature. Chombe's submission was the key to UN success, but they had failed to place a guard on Chombe's residence. The president fled to the British consul, who encouraged him to defy the UN. Britain, with her considerable financial interests in Union Minière, now became Chombe's principal champion, and the gendarmes began to counterattack, led by the remaining mercenaries. Around 7 o'clock, or 700 hours, a call came from battalion headquarters in Elizabethville stating that Operation Mortar had taken place. All installations had been captured by the United Nations troops and that to inform Commandant Quinlan uh, to be on the alert. Five minutes before they attacked us at mass, that's when he found out about Operation Mortar. And even then they didn't tell the truth. They said it was a complete success. My eye. Everyone in the country except us knew about Operation Martyr, including the gendarmerie who were waiting for them. Were you were prepared for it. Well, we weren't. Men were at mass at this time except a few fellows who were in the trenches. It was normal local protection. Uh, mass had just started, as a matter of fact, and uh, firing broke out. So about a party of other platoons tried to rush our position and fired, and they were driven off. Uh, that was our first indication of what really happened. Everyone was in their trenches and waited and waited and waited. So it was very quiet all over, an eerie, eerie situation. And then about 11 o'clock in the morning, it started. I was a qualified mortar officer, so I knew exactly when I heard the first pops of, of the weapons being fired that they were actually mortars. And my, my reaction was I could not believe that we were being mortared. This was very quickly followed by the rattle of uh, heavy machine guns. And very quickly then, our own troops went into action, firing uh, Vickers machine guns, and firing the uh, 60 millimeter mortars in, in addition to small arms fire. Would it be able to pull a tree around a human being? That was my biggest worry. And of course, when the time came, you never even thought of it, it came automatic. If someone stopped up in front of you, if you saw a target, you shot and that was it. Who's going to be the best man at the end of the day? That's how you feel. There's no in between. You just fight. But it is hard to shoot people that you have nothing against. It's very hard to do that. But there's no other way. They were very brave men, these in Germany. They were rushing a defended position and they were not getting very far and they were suffering tremendous casualties, as we heard afterwards, which is not something anyone takes any pride in. Within about 200 yards of our positions, they stopped and very, very quickly then started to withdraw and uh, made their way back towards Janetville. Needless to remark, we were absolutely thrilled that we had beaten off this attack. We were, we were highly elated, and uh, the question was, uh, will there be another attack? So we had to stay on the alert for the rest of that, that day, and in addition, listen to our colleagues being martyred and machine gunned up in number one platoon and support platoon areas. We could see the movement of the troops and were firing. and every time we saw somebody we'd fire on them. And unfortunately I got shot then that time, about that time. I got shot through the tie, went up 
across my thigh and up into my stomach, out, out the other direction, so. And as soon as I got his, natural enough, being foolish and inexperienced, I jumped up, and when I jumped up, I was hit from the front, in the chest, just to the right of the chest, so. The bullet hit the magazines and killed the power. So it didn't actually hit me. But it exploded all the magazine, all the, the rounds in the magazine. So that's how close I was to seeing no more action for that day or ever. And Commandant Joe Clone was the medical officer and he cleaned out the wounds and he, he patched them up as well as he could. So the next morning I was able to hobble around so I was back out again in the trenches and continue on fighting. When the Secretary General arrived in Leopoldville that day, he was surprised to hear that the UN was attempting to end Katangi's secession by force. The UN was at war, his worst fears realized. He took full responsibility and ordered O'Brien to locate Chombe and bring the military action to an end in the shortest possible time. Uh, Mr. Chombe took refuge with Mr. Denzel Dunnett, British Consul in Elizabethville. Uh, we, Mr. Dunnett did not inform the United Nations. Mr. Dunnett said that Mr. Chombe came to him that morning, six o'clock in the morning of the 13th September, when firing had already broken out. Uh, according to Mr. Dunnett, uh, Mr. Chombe sat there for one hour and they did not discuss politics. Mm -hmm. I'm still trying to believe that. O'Brien and Raja ordered the removal of A Company from Jadoville, but General McKeown feared the Katangese would see this as a sign of weakness on the part of the UN and asked that they remain. Three platoons of Irish soldiers from B Company with two Swedish armoured cars were sent to Jadoville to reinforce A Company. When they reached the Lufira Bridge, 20 miles from Jadoville, they encountered determined opposition and launched an assault on the bridge. First of all, we heard around uh, 1,600 hours, we could hear the mortar fire at the Lufira Bridge. We could clearly hear mortars and machine guns, and this fire lasted maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Suddenly it was decided by the commander that we would pull back and we would review the situation and we would make another attack at first light. That was the following morning. Well, we were looking to see their heads coming over the hill any minute, but they never arrived. And uh, I wasn't surprised because it, was le it left so long. And the following morning it was decided at battalion headquarters, that we didn't have sufficient strength, we didn't have martyrs, etc., etc., that we'd come back, regroup, and a much stronger force would be put in position. That night, McKeown and Hammerschild attended a dinner with the Congolese government. Hammerschild appeared calm despite the storm of international outrage at the UN's actions. Although O'Brien's announcement of the ending of secession had severely embarrassed the UN, Hammerschild strongly defended the UN's actions, claiming that they were acting in self-defense. <laughs> 